Welcome back to Cannabis Class Episode 9. This is Part 2, Steps to be a Safer Stoner. We're going to continue our talk about some of the dangers of cannabis, gateway drugs, addiction, and some best practices to enjoy cannabis while exposing yourself to the least risk. I promise to talk about addiction in regards to cannabis, and I want to be careful on this topic, because for a long time, weed was touted as safer than other drugs. Specifically, because you can't get addicted to it. It was a refrain I often heard it used to support legalization. The thing is, you can get addicted to cannabis, but it has its differences from a classic model of addiction. You can have a dependence, whether it be mental or physical, and unlike what I often heard, you can have a withdrawal, but it is unlikely to be nearly as severe. Cannabis addiction can alter someone's behavior and attitude. If they stop cold turkey, they might become anxious, moody, they might lash out, and of course desire more cannabis. Plus, people can become so entrenched in a cannabis lifestyle that they feel like they can't get through a normal day without it. But as far as I've found, no one has ever died from withdrawal. Let's compare that to other drugs of abuse like cocaine, alcohol, methamphetamines, or heroin. Here are opiate withdrawal symptoms, which can be extremely uncomfortable. Runny nose, tearing and dilated pupils, excessive sweating, anxiety, insomnia, rapid heart rate and high blood pressure, muscle aches, digestive upset and diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, seizures, and death. There are three stages of drug addiction outlined by Coop and Bolko that can also present in cannabis addiction. Their studies acknowledge that the stages may not be as robust as with other drugs. Addiction entails a compulsive drug seeking and intake, a loss of control and limiting intake, and the emergence of a negative emotional state when access to a drug is prevented. The drug seeking is an impulsivity and compulsivity to use the drug, despite negative consequences associated with such use. The stage of withdrawal is triggered by opponent process responses following binge episodes, meaning symptoms such as increased anxiety, chronic irritability, malaise, and dysphoria during drug abstinence. And anticipation is implicated in the reinstatement of substance use following abstinence. These are commonalities shared with cannabis addiction, and symptoms of cannabis withdrawal specifically include irritability, anger or aggression, nervousness or anxiety, sleep difficulty, decreased appetite or weight loss, restlessness, depressed mood, and physical symptoms causing discomfort. With the addition of withdrawal as a symptom of CUD, cannabis use disorder, it is evident that the development of cannabis addiction parallels addiction to other drugs of abuse. However, as mentioned, it is typically mild and doesn't result in death. And distinctly, there are no baseline differences in dopamine receptor availability between cannabis users and healthy controls, something that does not parallel the classic idea of addiction. So that's addiction related to cannabis. But what about the, chem the chemicals in your cannabis? Well, as a plant, you should have the same concerns as any produce you get at a grocery store what's involved in its growth, have pesticides been applied, do the stores do anything to manipulate its appearance, like the wax on apples, for example. And for all of these questions, you're going to have to do your own research and questioning that fits in line with what is and isn't acceptable to you. Maybe find a brand you trust and stick with it. Some people don't pay attention to these things, but I'm someone who reads the ingredient labels at grocery stores, and honestly, I think most consumer goods are inherently bad, but it's your indifference that enables companies to treat consumers as they do. Like, is it worth it to buy goods at that massive chain store over something local grown, when the price cut comes at the cost of your health and a general prioritization of investors' returns over public interest? You know, there's a reason most major companies have lost or settled multi-million dollar lawsuits and are more willing to engage in those than fix the core problem. But hey, that's what freedom is about, right? 
a healthy, willful ignorance for the sake of minor conveniences. Anyway, I am well beyond the point of this video, so I'll reel it back in. I was next going to discuss the chemicals involved with the smoking of cannabis, and there's some mixed views on this. I broke down the components for you a couple videos ago, but I don't really consider anything but fresh air going into my lungs a good idea, so I try to keep smoking to a minimum. It's why I prefer consumables and topicals. But smoking is such a common way to use cannabis, and it's a bit of a staple as the social standard for cannabis users that it can be quite difficult to get away from altogether. So with that in mind, here's what we know about the dangers of smoking cannabis. Cannabis contains a similar range of harmful chemicals to that of tobacco smoke, including bronchial irritants, tumor promoters, and carcinogens. But the smoking topography for cannabis results in higher per puff exposures to inhaled tar and gases. Studies show that rats can't respirate as well after smoking, but that is independent of THC, so that's just having something in the lungs, not cannabis specifically. Debates generally indicate that vaping is better than combustion smoking, as you're not burning cannabis and plant material. It heats cannabis at a set temperature and doesn't have the variability of flame. There's no butane or other gas, and it doesn't get mixed with nicotine or tobacco, as you can do with blunts. For this reason, some people smoke strictly joints over blunts, but that can be cultural as well, as when I spent time in France, I found that very few users smoked straight cannabis. And there are all sorts of personalizations people use to help produce perceived problems, like using a hemp wick to light instead of a butane lighter. So let's tackle a couple uh, let's tackle a couple other generic health concerns brought up in November 2019 by the FDA. They issued concerns about the safety of CBD, stating that CBD use has potential to cause liver injury, interfere with the mechanisms of prescription drugs, produce gastrointestinal disorders, or affect alertness and mood. During its review of the marketing application for Epidiolex, remember purified CBD that the FDA approved in 2018 for the treatment of two seizure disorders. The FDA identified the potential for liver injury. They claim, quote, this serious risk can be managed when an FDA approved CBD drug product is taken under medical supervision. Although this risk was increased when taken with other drugs that impact the liver. Signs of liver injury were seen also in patients not on those drugs, end quote. Now, the issue here is that there isn't any source information given, no studies to review. Uh, the problem with this curtain is that I can't see the data and get a sense of the severity or reproducibility of the results. All we know is that the FDA is saying there is a potential for liver injury, not the extent of that damage. You don't know if it's mild or severe, but reading between the lines, it would seem to be rather mild, as medical personnel monitoring is considered enough not some alteration of drug administration or additional medication. One more for CBD is the question of male reproductive toxicity. Studies in laboratory animals showed male reproductive toxicity, including in the male offspring of CBD-treated pregnant females. The changes seen include decrease in testicular size, inhibition of sperm growth and development, and decreased circulating testosterone among others. Because these findings were only seen in animals, it is not yet clear what these findings mean for human patients. And it's the same scenario with outsources to poll, but from a similar topic studying Swiss mice, we see that the mice treated with 15 to 30 milligrams of CBD daily for a month had effects still present a month after cessation. That's an upsetting indicator to me, as what we see for most cannabis symptoms is a temporal change that returns within a very short span. However, 30 milligrams to a mouse is a bit more significant than to an adult human, so I think we have a little wiggle room. Moving on to our last topic, before some expertly curated advice, gateway drugs. A topic you know way less about than you think, especially for the number of times that you've heard about it. But really, this is more like one of those stories the media picked up and ran with as a sensitization, not a research topic. So, is cannabis a gateway drug? Well, as much as any other substance, including alcohol, nicotine, or 
even prescription medicine can be considered a gateway drug? Yes. But the entire concept of a gateway drug is flawed. Here is what can be proven. An early introduction to an abuse substance can increase likelihood of addiction to other abuse substances later in life. This was shown when rodents given nicotine-laced water early in their development demonstrated enhanced responses to cocaine later. As well, studies have indicated that individuals who begin using tobacco products earlier in life will often develop other issues with substance use and abuse, including to substances like alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, and heroin. There seems to be consistency with this idea outside of nicotine as the initial influence as well. What isn't shown is that trying an abuse substance will increase the chance of trying other abuse substances, a common misunderstanding of the term gateway drug, which dismantles the case against stripping our society of any single substance, claiming that would reduce drug-related problems. And that idea has been floated numerous times in various scenarios. Although, if we're being honest, many members of our society aren't even distinguishing between drug use and abuse. Merely the idea of a drug is treated with blanket repulsion, so providing evidence in any direction won't really reach an understanding there. The takeaway about gateway drugs is that although those who use any specific drug may have an underlying propensity to take drugs in general, this idea is being misrepresented as those trying a certain drug, which is likely to be a more common, less expensive, and readily available one, makes the person more likely to do harder drugs, which are more rare, expensive, and harder to obtain, and have a higher likelihood of a negative outcome of which there just isn't any given causation. So, to put in an example, if you walk down your street today looking for drugs, you're a lot more likely to be able to get a cigarette than PCP. Simple. It's not as though that cigarette makes you want PCP, but if you did want PCP, you're still way more likely to obtain the cigarette first. Hopefully that helps with a little bit of perspective, although I imagine I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. So. Finally, we're going to wrap up with some smoking safety. A 2017 article came up with a cannabis use guideline featuring 10 major recommendations for lower risk use, with most recommendations having substantial or good quality evidence. For each, I will only mention if the evidence is less than substantial. I've curated that list to give you the most useful recommendations and trim the fat of the blatantly obvious. So, starting with recommendation number three. High THC content products are associated with higher risks of various mental and behavioral problem outcomes. Ideally, use cannabis products with low THC content or high CBD to THC ratios given the evidence of CBD's attenuating effects on some THC-related outcomes. Recommendation four. Synthetic cannabinoids, like spice and K2, indicate markedly more acute and severe adverse health effects. The use of these products should be avoided, and that evidence grade is limited. Recommendation number five. Regular inhalation of combusted cannabis adversely affects respiratory health outcomes. It is generally preferable to avoid routes of administration that involve smoking combusted cannabis material, for example, by using vaporizers or edibles. Use of edibles eliminates respiratory risks, but the delayed onset of psychoactive effect may result in the use of larger than intended doses and subsequently increase, mainly acute, adverse effects. Recommendation six, users should avoid practices such as deep inhalation, breath holding, or the Valsalva maneuver, as these, pros- as these practices disproportionately increase the intake of toxic material into the pulmonary system. That evidence grade is limited. Recommendation 7, frequent or intensive, that is daily or near daily cannabis use, is strongly associated with higher risks of experience adverse health and social outcomes related to cannabis use. And recommendation 9, there are some populations at probable higher risk for cannabis related adverse effects who should refrain from using cannabis. These include individuals with predisposition for or first degree family history of 
psychosis, and substance use disorders, as well as pregnant women. These recommendations, in part, are based on precautionary principles. Bada boom, bada bing! Now you have an overview of the dangers associated with cannabis use and ways to go about your interest in a more informed manner.